Welcome everybody. Uh, today, as we present and continue our webinar series that we've had over these long 13 months, um, we are looking forward to sharing information with you today around cloud backup administration. And we thank everybody for joining us. Go to that next slide, Andrew. So everybody should have come into the Zoom room muted. We ask that you please ask questions into the chat window. If we don't answer them in moment, we will. Uh, we have designated some time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that have come up. Uh, we will also send a link to the recording following the webinar for reference. Feel free to take any notes, but just know that you will have the recording sent to your email um, early next week. I'm Kelly Sinicola. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Executive Vice President over our colleague practice here, as well as Security Cloud and Infrastructure, um, and some of our CRM practice as well. So hello to those of you that I know, and nice to meet you to those that I don't know yet. Today, I am very happy to present Andrew Russell. He's the director of our core system administration team here at Forelli. He's been with the organization a long time and knows many, many things. So as I posted on LinkedIn earlier this week, I always learn something when Andrew's talking. So really looking forward to share the information that we have with you today. Andrew, take it away. Thank you, Kelly, for the high praise. Um, so today we wanna, on top of talking about cloud backups, we just wanna cover some of the basics about backups in general. Um, so we wanna start off with why are backups more important than most think? Uh, so first off is internal mistakes. Uh, just this week, we've had two situations where the schools we're working with had data loss due to um, uh, human error. So the first one was a uh, customized program that wiped out the entire emergency contact table. Uh, so we had to restore from backup there. We also had a situation where, where the GL line item that is attached to taking web payments was deleted out of a school in production. And so that had to be rebuilt. So internal mistakes certainly happen. Uh, you also have situations with hardware failure that um, as hardware starts to age or even some newer hardware, you'll have something fail and uh, you can have an opportunity for data loss. Uh, on the cloud side, if you have things running on the cloud, um, you know, ultimately, whether it be Azure or AWS or IBM, all of their clouds run on hardware and that hardware fails sometimes. And so you, when those situations happen, they will give you a notification. They'll say you have until this time to turn it off and turn it back on and that'll move it to a new host. Uh, and if you don't, don't do that in time, if you don't get to it in time, you will have data loss. Uh, uh, it's important in situations where you have damaged on-campus hardware due to extreme events. Um, when I first started in consulting back in 2011, that was only weather for me. And since then I've had I've heard stories of, of schools that had their server rooms broken into, they had their copper stolen, um, they had vandals in the server room just destroying things for fun. Um, so it's not just because of uh, weather, it's also because of uh, extreme events that happen on your campus. Uh, it, probably the most common one that we see is server rooms like to flood. Uh, they're usually put in places that have water near them and or they're below ground level and the groundwater starts to seep in. Um, and one of the main reasons why we're here today is ransomware and that the top four things were a, well, that might happen every five years. If we don't have the backups, it's not that big of a deal. Um, that, that's been the prevailing opinion that I've seen across schools is they're really not worried about their backups because the top four situations are very unlikely. With ransomware, we've now seen 12 schools get hit in 18 months. Uh, and those are those are schools that we work with uh, either in our core services or uh, have done consulting for. Um, and in those situations, uh, those are absolute loss events. Your entire network in, in most situations, unless it's caught in the middle, is completely wiped out. Um, it is, uh, it's very similar to uh, if you've ever had your car broken into or have a home invasion or had your house robbed, you, it's very similar to that you go through you go through shock you go through denial you, it's just being with these schools as they've gotten hit by these things it is a, a very traumatic event 
And I can tell you that of those dozen schools, over half of them did not have good backups. And by hook or by crook, we were able to get them back up and running. But just to be frank, I fear the day that somebody gets hit with ransomware at a school and they've lost all their data. And I'm not, I'm not an alarmist. I'm not, uh, I'm usually pretty laid back. You, you can certainly ask Rob and Kelly that. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not the type that tries and scares people, but I can tell you that this is a very real risk in higher education. And so we wanted to, to come out and, and talk about backups and, and really try and solve some of these problems for schools. So today we're going to talk about um, backup best practices, and we're also going to talk about uh, the benefits of doing some of those best practices in the cloud, as the, the presentation was titled. So those best practices are off-domain and off-campus backups, multi-factor authentication, uh, GFS rotation, monitoring and alerting, backup, uh, sorry, database backups, and testing restores. And this is where uh, cloud-based backups come into play. So uh, backups should run off the domain. You should not be able to access your backup um, service accounts, your backup vaults, or your backup catalogs with your domain level credentials. This has been the, uh, this has been one of the main attack vectors from the ransomware attacks that we've seen. And backup service accounts are one of the key attack vectors that ransomware attackers will try and take advantage of because if they can get a backup service account that's running account uh, domain wide, it's got access to your entire server farm. And so, um, it's very important that just the, the minimum uh, set of requirements for a modern day backup solution is that it is off domain, that the backup service accounts don't exist. Most of the backup solutions now that run off the domain, it require a client to be installed on the machines and those clients report back to the backup software instead of having a backup service account that needs to go and, and run through SMB shares. Uh, and then finally, backup vaults and catalogs should not be accessible from the domain. I can tell you that we've had schools that have their backup solution off the domain. Um, they don't have those service accounts like we talked about, and they're still using, uh, but just for convenience sake, they enabled the backup vault or the backup catalog to be accessible via the domain uh, just to, to do a simple restore or uh, to analyze the files. And so what happened in that scenario is the school, their backups got encrypted because those were accessible even though their system was off domain. Um, and this is, is coming into the cloud-based system as far as copies should be stored off campus. So in years past, uh, when uh, tapes were in vogue and uh, tapes even in today's systems uh, if you don't have a cloud-based solution, tapes could actually play a, a vital role. But uh, it, it, back in the day when we all had tapes, uh, in fact, uh, remember working with one school, they had uh, a uh, walked into their campus for the first time, walked in the IT department, saw a grocery bag and said, oh, somebody got groceries. Uh, no, that's actually backup tapes. Um, so, uh, and they were being carried off campus. Uh, so, it, it's very important to get those backups off campus. And so the, the thoughts behind that is uh, one, if you have a, a natural disaster on campus, depending on where you are in the country, uh, and you say your server room floods or you have those vandals break in um, and you, you lose your infrastructure, you probably would lose your own prem data backup solution. So copies of those backups should be taken off campus. Uh, the other reason for this would be uh, in a situation with ransomware, it, it's just very similar to a, a server room flooding. Your entire network is knocked out. So you might even have valid backups, but you have nothing you can plug it into because the, the servers have been compromised, the VM hosts have been compromised, the switches are not no longer be trusted because you're, the attackers could have been in there. So everything has to be checked and cleaned. And if you have that in the cloud, it's a lot easier to restore in the cloud because you're, you're, you've already got... Uh, you, you've already got it off-prem. You don't have to worry about getting connected anywhere. Um, and these are the, the last two things are, is what I would consider uh, new information as far as the things that we've been seeing recently with backup with ransomware attacks. Backup admin sites that are off-domain should only be used 
over TLS connections. So if your backup software gives you a website or a tool to access it, you need to make sure that it's done over uh, TLS connections. Uh, it used to be called SSL connections. So you need to make sure that in your browser, you've got the lock as you're uh, connecting in. And then backward admin passwords should be unique from every other password in your system and follow password best practices. So that's random strings of numbers and letters of a minimum of 20 characters. Um, we bring this up because the most recent ransomware attack we've seen, uh, the attackers were able to, even though the system was off-prem and it was uh, completely separate from the domain, they were able to access that backup solution. And we believe they either sniffed the password from a clear text interface or the password was, was reshared across multiple systems. Um, and so it's very important that you protect the, and use best practices when it comes to password policies uh, for your backup solution. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. Uh, any administrator account in your domain, in your infrastructure, should require multi-factor authentication, period. Um, we have been speaking with a lot of schools trying to, to push this as much as we can. And, and frankly, we're not trying to sell anything. We're, this is just trying to help you protect yourselves uh, from ransomware attack. Multi-factor authentication is the number one protection against ransomware. If your admin accounts are protected with multi-factor authentication, it makes it a lot more difficult for these attackers to attack your domain, attack your backup solutions, um, it, traverse your network, because it's they're going to be hitting up against that multi-factor authentication, whether it be Duo or text messages. Um, Duo is considered to be best practice, or some sort of uh, uh, like uh, some sort of phone app, like uh, the Microsoft Authenticator or the Google Authenticator. Uh, but bare minimum would be text messages, even though that's considered to not be secure. Um, this is important for backup solutions. It's important for everything. And, and the, the pushback that we're getting when we try and push this to schools is that there's a political battle that, that our end users don't want multi-factor authentication when they're logging into their desktop and they don't want it when they're logging into a uh, colleague. And if that's the political battle, please know that you can separate this out to where you can set up policies to where only your admins need multi-factor authentication. You don't have to have your end users using multi-factor authentication so your admins uh, are using it. Uh, you can split those out. So if you can't get it passed internally that you need multi-factor uh, for everything, then you can at least take the step of getting your administrators to use multi-factor for everything. That's a, that's a great first step. It shouldn't require any sort of political battles. Um, and as far as purchasing something like Duo or, or using multi-factor with you know, the, multi, the Microsoft Authenticator and the Google Authenticator are free. Um, the configuration to, to use those things is not uh, not a heavy lift. Uh, so by all means, this is something that we could, I could not emphasize this more. Um, just wanted to throw this in here for another lesson learned for some of our clients that have been hit with ransomware. Uh, for database backups, uh, MS SQL and Oracle backups are best handled natively. So. Uh, we've seen a lot of schools that will try and do snapshot backups for database servers. Well, we've also seen them try and do file level backups for database servers. And um, the snapshots are great for trying to recover configurations on software and whatnot. But if you want an accurate backup of your database, you really need to use the native tools. Um, the, the good news is, is that Commvault, Veeam, uh, Unitrends, uh, basically every major reputable backup vendor that we know of uh, supports those native SQL backups and native Oracle backups. So all you have to do is, is just configure it in the software and then it will it will schedule those backups and then store those in the backup appliance. Um, but uh, if you do a snapshot, there is a chance you won't be able to recover your databases uh, from the snapshot or from the file level backup. Uh, we had a situation uh, I used to say you wouldn't be able to but uh, we, we, ran, we got very lucky with the school here recently that only had file level backups and we were able to recover the SQL system. Um, don't leave these things to chance though, follow best practices and, and be as careful as possible. Uh, this also circles back on the cloud uh, configuration a bit as far as the GFS rotation. So the GFS rotation is just shorthand for grandfather, father, son, 
rotation. So this is uh, a rotation that's recommended for uh, baseline um, uh, important systems, key systems on your on your network that you know the data is volatile, meaning it's changing on a regular basis. So our, our basic recommendation is uh, uh, to take uh, seven dailies. Uh, you know, it used to be five, but everybody's running seven days a week now. So take seven dailies and then save one of those dailies as a, so that, that was the, the dailies are your sons, your uh, weeklies are the father, uh, and then your, uh, then you take a monthly, which is the grandfather, and then a yearly, which is technically a great grandfather, or you can, in some situations, you can call it grand, grandfather. But not to get wrapped up in the terminology, but the idea is, is that you get a dailies for uh, immediate resource needs, you get uh, weekly and monthly and yearly for point in time resource. Uh, I know uh, we have run into situations where um, a, a school would have some data loss, but not recognize it until six months down the road. And uh, so we, we actually had to go back and try and find a six month old backup and restore from that and then, and then restore the particular bit of data that was needed from that data loss and then compare it with production environment. Obviously you, you wouldn't under best circumstances recover your entire production environment from a six month old backup, but uh, it has been very handy when it's been needed. Um, you also have uh, federal and state requirements for backups as far as backup retention. Uh, to my knowledge for most states and, and, and for federal, it's at least seven years. So, I highly recommend you checking with your state and local governments to, to see what uh, your backup requirements are, specifically if you're a community college or part of a state system. I guarantee you, you've got a policy regarding this and most schools don't aren't aware of that and aren't following that. So it's very important that, that you pay attention to those. You don't wanna be out of compliance with your state. Um, and, and circling back to the cloud-based solution. So in the past, we would recommend um, taking those, uh, grandfather tapes or grandfather media of, of any sort and shipping those off to a, a storage facility such as uh, Iron Mountain was a very popular one. Uh, nowadays, you can take those backups and ship them off to a cloud-based solution. So, um, you know, uh, Unitrends and uh, Veeam and uh, Commvault, they all have solutions to um, have long-term cold storage on your backups. The other thing that could, ha could happen if needed is you can actually take those backups and uh, ship them off to something like AWS Glacier or AWS Deep Freeze. And um, our only recommendation for that is don't store things in those type products unless you know that you're gonna need them, uh, you, you won't need them quickly. So like with Glacier, you're looking at usually um, at Glacier and Deep Freeze, you're looking for somewhere between a 12 to 36 hour uh, process of getting that data back from AWS. So you, you really need to judge that. So would you put your dailies or your weeklies in there? No, but would it make sense to put in your yearlies? Probably, and you can, it's just pennies on the dollars to store things in Glacier and Deep Freeze. Uh, and, and that way you don't have to worry about the tape degrading. You don't have to worry about, uh, some schools used to do CDs, thank God we've gotten past that point, but you don't have to worry about the media degrading over at Iron Mountain or somebody in Iron Mountain making a mistake. It's just, it's, it can all stay digital, but it would be in, in different locations and you'd still be able to follow best practices. Um, monitoring and learning. Uh, backups not monitored usually aren't running properly. Uh, we've run into several situations where, uh, Schools, either from a ransomware attack or otherwise, um, you know, we got to the point where, hey, we're going to need a restore of this data to this place. And the back end admin went, um, I got something from four weeks ago. Is that okay? Uh, that's not really a situation you want to be in. Backups should be actively monitored. Um, we had a situation here with a ransomware attack where uh, the school needed to recover from data, but it turned out the attacker had gotten in and stopped the backup service. He wasn't able to encrypt the data because it was cloud-based, but he was able to stop the backup service. So basically when the attacker hit, they were a week behind on backups and they were not able to, to do anything else other than recover from that week old data. So they lost a week of registration from that situation. Um, each school should have a backup administrator that checks backup jobs. Uh, 
you know, at most schools, I understand that you can't have a full-time person doing that, but you certainly need somebody that's, that's part of their job description. Uh, we run into a lot of situations where we'll, and, and this has become a, a trend as of the last five years, as IT staffs have had to shrink, where it used to be, we'd be able to go, okay, who's your backup administrator? Oh, that's, that's Jim or that's Joe. Nowadays, it's, well, we kind of do it by committee. When you do it by committee, that isn't, you know, it doesn't get done. Um, so you really have to have somebody that's in charge of it, that checks it, that monitors it. And you should have alerting set up on your backup software. Um, that's the other thing, it, you know, just in case they're not able to check it on a daily basis, at the bare minimum, there, sh there should be alerts that get sent out to your alerting system that, uh, that alert admins when the backup service is stopped, when the backup schedule is changed, when a backup job fails, when a backup job is running over scheduled time. Um, I can tell you just from an operational standpoint, we've run into a situation where if a backup job was running over a scheduled time, it was causing a pr production outage. And we had to call several people to try and figure out what was going on with the backup jobs. And then somebody finally looked at it and went, oh yeah, well, this is running 12 hours when it's supposed to, we need to stop it and start it over after business hours. These are the kind of things that you should be alerted to. This should be considered a um, mission as mission critical as a service going down or a server going down on your network. Um, this is one of our last best practices slides, but uh, as far as uh, testing restores, any untested backup system should be considered broken until proven otherwise. Um, and I can just tell you that that's often the case. I mean, the first time that I tested a backup, and this was back when I first started my career, did my first restore, nothing worked. And everybody on the campus thought that we were taking good backups. And the reality was we didn't have good backups. And so I had to re, I had to actually redesign their backup system because we knew what we had didn't work. So we had to start from scratch and, and, and start testing backups. And that's been a trend that we've seen at several schools where uh, a, uh, we have a disaster and um, and nothing and nothing's able to be restored just because they or, or they, they would get we're able to get things like temp files but as far as things that are really needed they're not getting restored um uh probably the the funnest anecdote i can give is back when i was at my first school uh i got to sit in the room as my director told online education that even though she had paid for duplicate drives and duplicate um uh backups and uh, she even paid for backup software. Uh, she didn't have a backup. And so the, the 30 uh, classes that had been deleted on their LMS system and, and Blackboard wasn't able to be restored. They were going to have to rebuild them. Uh, and I can only say it's fun now because it wasn't fun being in the room then. But looking, you know, looking back, it, it certainly was a turning point for us as a, as a department where we could really um, get better at doing restores. Uh, restore key systems should be tested quarterly. And when I say quarterly, it just comes down to the fact that it, it, it used to be a, a yearly recommendation. This is something that's changed with ransomware. Backups are a lot more important to your infrastructure. So uh, restores of key systems should be tested quarterly just in case you have a massive change on your infrastructure or you've tested, you've changed your backup solution. We've had a, a, a recent situation with schools that a school that changed their backup solution and we didn't get that native backup set up like we had on the previous uh, system and they didn't know to ask us and we didn't know that they changed the backup solution. So if we would have tested the backup restore, we would have known that, that we, that of the change. Um, the other thing I would say, and this is something that I'm not going to get into today, but your school should have a DR plan and your DR plan should include test days. And, um, uh, one of my teammates loves to tell the story about, uh, uh where I, at my first school that we worked, my director set up uh, a test aid where they basically put me in a room, said that I'd been hit, by, hit up by a bus and that everybody else had to go rebuild colleague. And he said the, the next three days were some of the, the most, uh, it was the biggest learning uh, event that he'd had in his career. Um, so it's very important that you take the key people out that you know they'd be able to restore it and you put people in that wouldn't be able to restore it. And how that helps in disasters is you're going to have people that can't get to campus. You're going to have people that are having to do other things. And in an event of a ransomware attack, if you have the one guy 
that is uh, is only able to do restores, uh, or if you have the one guy that's only able to do server rebuilds, they become the bottleneck. And when you're having to rebuild an entire infrastructure, one person being a bottleneck is a very big problem. So uh, our poll today is, and this will be coming up in the chat, uh, how often do you do, uh, are you doing test restores of your data? Four times a year, twice a year, once a year, sh we should test restores? And I look forward to your response. And we're starting to get some results in. I'll give everyone a few more seconds to respond to the poll. Okay, let's see. Unfortunately, Andrew, you're going to be distressed to learn that the majority of folks said we should test resource, question mark, followed by once a year, and then a tie in last place for four times a year and twice a year. I can't stress enough how important it is to test resource. Um, and hopefully those answers were um, our staff having fun. Um, and uh, that's not reality, but if that is reality and you need help, uh, please reach out and we can help you with that. So we understand that um, good backup administration is usually a research resource constraint. Uh, a lot of schools that we've spoken with uh, have all the intention in the world to, um, to have good backups. They know that it's important. They just don't have the people nor they have the budget for the people to, to do it properly. So we have, uh, out of necessity, we have built a managed service just like what we do with our core system administration services on the colleague side and on the banner side. We have now built out a uh, managed services for backup administration. And um, just like those services, we have three tiers uh, for these services. Um, we have a backup health check, we have a core standard backup administration with Unitrends, and then we have a core enhanced backup administration with Unitrends. So the backup health check is a one-time engagement. Uh, you can bring us in as many times as you want, but the contracts are, are for one time only. Uh, we are offering this as a yearly freebie to our core system administration clients, uh, where we're happy to produce this report for you. But effectively, we're, what we're gonna do in these backup health checks is review backup schedules, uh, review backup strategies, review backup logs, uh, inter interview your backup administrator, and then produce an audit report. And so from that audit report, we'll be able to tell you when the last time a backup was tested, we'll be able to tell you how your backups look, we'll be able to tell you uh, if you're following best practices and anything that we've covered today, uh, and, and really just give you an overall health of your environment. Uh, the core standard backup administration is when we get into the monthly managed service. So this would be a monthly contract, um, which includes a quarterly health check of a primary backup system. Uh, so this is a, and then we would also add an additional backup solution uh, with the Unitrans cloud backup. So uh, just to talk a little, get really technical for a second. Uh, if you have a primary backup solution on-prem, it's usually using the Windows uh, shadow system uh, to do backups. Uh, once that's taken over by one system, we can't take it over by another. Thankfully, the Unitarians cloud backup system is a file-based backup solution. So uh, we would uh, basically be a secondary. And so the idea here is you would only utilize this on servers that were most important. Uh, for instance, for colleague, your colleague database server, your colleague app server, uh, for banner, it'd be your Oracle systems. Um, you know, basically looking for places that if you have a disaster, uh, what are the things that you absolutely cannot lose? Um, we will also do quarterly test restores from this Unitrends cloud backup solution. Uh, we're going to do 24 seven monitoring of the Unitrends cloud backup solution. So we'll have alerts that go over to our pager duty service that will get woken up if your, your backups don't run properly and we'll get in and resolve it. Hopefully get, get you a good backup before the next morning. Um, and then, uh, Basically, this is an insurance policy for key data. 
We're also going to include a Zest recovery response in this. So if you do have a ransomware attack on prem, um, we would work with you to recover uh, the data that we backed up and work on getting you back on your feet. Uh, our, our final tier is our core enhanced backup administration with Unitrends. Um, it's a primary backup solution with Unitrends with the Unitrends full backup solution. So um, the idea here is we would help you deploy the Unitrends full backup solution. That includes an on-campus appliance uh, that uses the Windows Shadow services for backups. And then we would also ship uh, backups from that appliance to the Unitrends cloud. Uh, we'd also um, apply quarterly backup health check reports uh, or produce those for you. We'd also produce quarterly test resource and that would be in the health check report, um, includes our 24 seven monitoring. And then we'd also have a disaster recovery response for that as well. Any questions? And at this point, you can feel free to bring yourself off of mute if you want to ask your question directly, or you can utilize the chat window, whatever you're more comfortable with. Uh, hi, Andrew. It's Mike Devardi from St. Peter's University. Hello. Thank you for that. That was very interesting and informative. One question about these three services. Um, so, and, and looking um, primarily at the second and third service. So what are some of the variables that are involved in terms of pricing out those services? Is it uh, number of students, number of users, number of gigabytes, you know, what do you do to price those out? So with the, um, with the second tier, which is the standard uh, tier, uh, we will have a monthly charge on our side. And then uh, at Forelli, we fully believe in you owning your cloud-based solution. So we would work with you to and Unitrends to um, to get those uh, that contract set up uh, and purchased. But effectively, the um, the prices on the Unitrend side are fifty dollars per server per year uh, for the for the the cloud-based side. Um, and then on the the the, the enhanced tier, uh, it is a, a lot more variable as far as price goes because there is a, an appliance involved, um, and then there's a, a there's a per uh, ter per terabyte charge or per gigabyte charge. So there's a, a a lot more variable there on that second tier because we are going to be deploying your entire backup solution at that point. Um, the uh, and that would be something where we would get we would need to do some, some discovery on your site to be able to, to give you those numbers and give you a recommendation, but we would work with you and Unitrends at the same time to make sure we gave you exactly what you needed and make sure that it was cost effective. Uh, the, the one thing I would say, just from looking at the numbers, we, we have been talking with Unitrends already uh, and looking at the numbers for the full campus solution, those prices are a lot more reasonable than, than you would think. Um, you're not actually um, paying for the appliance, you're actually paying a monthly fee to Unitrends and it, it it splits the cost of the appliance over a three year phase, three to five year phase. So it you'd be very surprised as the prices go. I, I know I was. All right, great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Since it's so quiet, I'll put people on the spot. Uh, Marsha and Andrew, do you want to talk about the work you've done for the 1% uh, program that we have here at Pirelli? I love to be put on the spot. <laughs> and yes, I will. One of the great things that, that Pirelli is involved with is Pledge 1%. It's an international give back program. Uh, we see Salesforce, a number, Microsoft, Apple, a lot of uh, companies are involved in that give back. Because Forelli works with higher education and we consider that family, 
we have selected higher ed as the uh, the depository of our give back. And what we are doing is either through consulting hours that our consultants um, work extra and give off contract to, to uh, universities and colleges, or any time that an institution has been hacked, their data has been compromised, there is an issue with uh, the security of their data, and it's out there. Uh, Forelli will go in and give 100 hours of free consulting. That's given free in the same sentence to uh, to that university to help them get get back on track and to at least find a pathway, find the vehicle that they move forward. So we're really proud of that. We've not put the information out and you guys are the very first folks to outside of Forelli to hear that. So aren't you glad you came to this conference, to this meeting today? <laughs> Andrew, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hijack. No, Mark. you're good. I actually wanted you to go first. Thank you. Um, so uh, as far as what those 100 hours look like, uh, at, uh, I believe we're at six schools now. We've helped rebuild their colleague environments from scratch after a ransomware attack. And we were um, generally there's a two week waiting period from uh, you bringing in forensics and seeing what basically the, under a ransomware attack, the insurance company runs the show. And so the insurance company will, uh, after the event is, is notified to the insurance company, the insurance company will bring in their forensics team and a restore team. Um, the forensics team has to give their okay before we can begin work. It's usually that's a one to two week lag depending on the team. Um, after that's done uh, and we're able to get data restored, we're usually able to get your UI up and running uh, within a day or two, uh, really depending on how, how fast the systems are. I, I can tell you that if, if you recover on-prem, which we do not recommend anymore, uh, it is a very rough go. Um, you're looking at a month before you're really stable. The, the, um, you're, you're going to be going through an entire rebuild of your network and your server infrastructure, and you don't really want your production environments in that system. So if you can avoid rebuilding on-prem and, and rebuild in AWS or rebuild in Azure, that's certainly our recommendation because it, it's a, you can be a lot more effective in doing a recovery, doing those in the cloud. But we've, uh, we're able to get Colleague UI up and running. And then within a week, we have all the web services running. Um, now, again, there's a caveat of, of dealing with instabilities. But at this point, we've learned a lot of tips and tricks in that type of instable environment to give you uh, tips is like, hey, you don't want to start registration on the day after we get red, uh, get colleague up and running. You really need to give it a week or two, and and let's work with your network admins and your infrastructure admins and that recovery team to um, to get everything stable before we release this out to everyone to get back on track. Uh, we can also work with um, Carbon Black and Sentinel One is really big from insurance companies. They will insist that you install those on anything that's rebuilt. Uh, Carbon Black is particularly difficult to get colleague running with, and we've we've learned those lessons, and we've we've been able to work with schools. So uh, it's uh, we take uh, ransomware very personally because we have, especially with our existing client base, um, we consider those sites as you know as we're part of those teams, and so um, I know Kelly and Rob and myself, we've all lost sleep over ransomware and over these attacks. And so anything that we can do to help rebuild and recover and even protect against, we're gonna do that. And we're going and this is just, this backup solution is really um, phase one. We're looking at everything we can to try and help out. So. All right, Andrew, a question from chat. Yeah. Um, I know database backups and multi-factor authentication are always, uh, are ways that may mitigate the risk of ransomware. Are there any security awareness trainings available to employees of the different higher education institutions? Uh, I, if you look on our What's New page and go down quite a bit, uh, in fact, we could probably get somebody to give you the, the direct link, but I have done some previous webinars on ransomware uh, prevention. Uh, we are gonna be doing another one here probably in the next uh, month or so. Uh, I've got some new information that I wanna share. I know Paul, our director of uh, our security cloud and infrastructure also has some things he wants to share 
um, that that's going to update that that presentation. But we're you know the the presentations we've done are still valid. It's just we've got some new information that we're going to share here in the next month or so. And one thing that we do recommend to schools is at least some level of security awareness training. There's different companies that provide that service. Um, you know, some are really elaborate and send out fake phishing emails, and then if they click on it, then the person doesn't pass that training. Um, you know, some are more anecdotal with, you know, little assessments that they're taking monthly, uh, but lots of different options in that arena as well. Yeah, and our security cloud and infrastructure team can do a complete security audit, and um, pen testing and uh, inventory of assets. So uh, we find, you know, I find that to be uh, most valuable when assessing an environment. Um, often what we find is, uh, especially when we're doing external uh, pen testing, is, uh, or is um, maybe routers with default uh, IP addresses that are endpoints that um, maybe the uh, CIO was not aware of. Um, uh, things that are misconfigured, like open FTP, FTP ports. Um, so if you're not, you know, whether you have us or somebody else do it, if you're not proactively scanning your environment, and you're not looking at those reports, especially the stuff that you have uh, on the web, um, it's only a matter of time. Uh, additionally, we have, uh, you know, we have tools that will, and if you're not doing endpoint management, uh, again, it's only a matter of time. If you don't, you know, we live in a day and age now that if it's on your network, you need to monitor it. Absolutely. Uh, if I could echo Rob's statement, um, as far as the pen testing goes, we have had several schools tell us we didn't know that server was still online. We didn't know that server was outside the firewall. We didn't know, we didn't know, we didn't know. And we understand that you are working on a limited budget and that you have limited staffing with limited training. It's all completely understandable, but just a simple pen test can tell you exactly what's accessible to the outside world. And it, usually those engagements are quick and, and they're, I would love to say they're painless. They're, they're pretty painful because you, as soon as you know, you got to do something about it, but it's better that you do something about it now rather than have your entire campus work wiped out and and have to rebuild from scratch. Um, that's that's really yeah, couldn't emphasize that enough. So for anybody else that's out there, it's your time. You could lightning round this. Any random? random questions or items that you'd like to get our opinion or feel on? Because there's certainly no shortage of opinions of Pirelli. I wanted to ask, um, are there any other security measures put in place to protect like, um, the databases and and the different backups from um, attacks from hackers. Uh, it depends on where you store them. So if they're on prem, um, you really got to keep it isolated to that backup network. Um, it would be wise to segment that out into its own VLAN um, and control the traffic and report off any traffic outside of uh, normal accepted traffic for that backup solution. And there are, they are different per solution. Um, as far as moving that out to the cloud, um, if you do, if you use a vendor and use their cloud, then you're really relying on them and their security. And so that goes to the lawyers and, and, you know, knowing if you can trust your, your backup vendor or not. Um, the, if you if you decide to roll your own and have put your backups in AWS and the deep freeze in Glacier or on the Azure side, um, there are a thousand things you can do to secure those environments. And it's all, uh, I wouldn't say it's simple, but it's all straightforward. 
and documented well. And um, if that's something that y'all are ever interested in, you know, we could certainly have a call with y'all and, and walk you through it. Uh, and our experiences as um, in clients that we do active monitoring for, and this is why I say endpoint monitoring is so important. And it's not just about having the monitors on the endpoints, actually watching the logs. It's you can potentially stop an attack midstream. We've done it by monitoring those logs. You know, there's been times where we've seen unusual activity and because of a quick response, we were able to, you know, uh, shut things down midstream. And so, uh, you know, and one of the big red flags that we have on our monitoring software is somebody installing something on this computer. Because nobody should be installing anything on the colleague computer. That's for sure. And if you haven't checked out the tools, and I mean, uh, so we're, you know, some of what Ferelli does, we are a 365 E5 client. And so we have implemented, you know, I would say we have implemented uh, the complete suite of uh, Microsoft uh, security tools. And even though we have people dispersed all over the US, uh, we're able to monitor and maintain uh, their individual devices and be able to, you know, uh, identify their patching levels, push patches, um, push uh, applications and things of that nature. Uh, and then there's uh, the other side of it, which is the cloud app security piece, which is very interesting and in where Microsoft uh, will look at things like, if, for things like uh, PII, uh, whether it be on OneDrive, uh, it'll look at third-party applications. So it'll, you know, you could even use it to monitor uh, Google apps. So, um, where some of this stuff, I would say, um, might have been out of reach a couple of years ago. I would say uh, the prices have come down. Uh, the tools have been democratized, so uh, they can be implemented on a wide scale. And um, so, uh, if if you haven't looked at some, uh, you know, some of the security stuff out there uh, in the marketplace, and again, we're happy to, you know, based on your environment. Um, you know, do an assessment, make recommendations. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, certainly a, a lot of opportunity to enhance your security footprint. Um, I know I can see that the company does um, or provides like cloud and infrastructure um, services. I was wondering if, if it was a part of the company's um, goal to motivate like um, future clients or current clients to move towards um, cloud backup over on-premises backup because of its flexibility, its security, and um, just the scalability of, you know, moving up or down in terms of the amount of um, data that needs to be stored. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, there is a technical limitation on cloud backups from uh, a lot of the different um, backup vendors in that they don't support cloud backup strictly um, from their on-prem client. So what that means is the client is loaded on a server and they don't technically allow for things to go directly to the cloud as far as those snapshots or VSS backups. Um, that, that is a technical limitation that they, every vendor that we've spoken with, they're trying to work towards, but there's a quite a bit of latency issue there that, that um, it just depends on how much internet bandwidth you have between their cloud and, and your, your school. Um, so their solution is to do the fast backups on-prem to the appliance and then ship those backups that the appliance is grabbing and ship those over to the cloud. That gives you two benefits. That gives you the benefit of being able to do a fast restore if you need it, as long as your on-prem is, is available. And for, for the situations we talked about that weren't disaster related, um, 
And then it also gives you a, a, a safety knowing that, hey, my backups are off-prem, they're good. We just need to, uh, so you get the best of both worlds. Well, uh, anybody, anybody else, you can ask any question you like. I'll do, Kelly and Rob and I will do our best to answer the questions. Sure, I got another one then. So um, we mentioned earlier that uh, when you're in the process of moving applications into the cloud, you know, like if you go to a vendor SaaS environment, on the one hand, you know, all, all the stuff you spoke about before, they take some responsibility for, but it's still, it's, it's still the school's responsibility to protect its own data for its students and employees. So I'm wondering if you have any recommendations uh, when you're evaluating vendors to host your application. Do you have any best practices you recommend as what types of questions we should be asking? And also, are there questions we should be asking these vendors, these SaaS vendors on a recurring basis every year just to make sure things are still what they said they are when they sold us? Absolutely. So. Um... Re regarding SaaS, uh, you ultimately that is the the vendor's responsibility, and so as far as how you evaluate those, you need to know what um, network security policies that they follow. Do they follow NIST? If they do, what level of NIST do they follow? Um, they should have all that documentation ready to hand you. Uh, if they don't and they take a long time, that's a big red flag. Um, if uh, you, you should be able to um, see what their their network credentials are, as far as uh, how they've uh, what their audits are, you know how often they've been audited, who's their auditing firm, that type of thing. They should be able to pro provide that for you pretty easily as well. If they if they struggle with that, then that's uh, that's something that um, that's something that that the vendor should be able to um, to provide for you. If, if, if they can't, then, then it's, a, it's a red flag. The other thing I would say is some of the SaaS's will allow you to take backups. So like, as far as I know, the Aleutian SaaS does not, but when you're talking about something like Salesforce or um, uh, something like Google Docs, they will all allow you, you know, the big vendors, they will allow you to take a backup of that solution. You can actually run a third-party backup solution of those cloud platforms and, and on top of those cloud platforms and ship those somewhere else. And that's like for Salesforce, we consider that to be best practice uh, to, to back up those solutions and not just rely on Salesforce. Um, we've also uh, seen that same sort of scenario with Office 365 uh, where, um, and Rob could speak a little bit more to this, but I believe we just had some data loss on Office, Office 365. And the only thing we could do is recover from our own backup because Microsoft wasn't able to provide a restore. So, um, it depends on what your SaaS is able to do as far as backups and resource, but ultimately you definitely want to give, give a high inspection when you select those, those vendors and make sure that they're following appropriate protocols. And if they're not, they don't have a security standard or if they aren't, aren't, aren't being audited on a regular basis and can't produce those audit reports or produce some sort of proof that they were audited, then I would, I would go on and, and look at the next vendor. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, philosophically, I believe in uh, cloud to cloud backup. <laughs> so um, uh, we do a lot of extensive, you know, it's kind of funny. We, we got to start digging, you know, you really got to start to dig deep because then you got to start to figure out, well, if I'm, but if I'm backing up Azure on uh, this platform, are they using Azure? <laughs> so you got to make sure that there is uh, uh, a separation. And so that's, you know, here at Forelli, we use a mixture of Azure and AWS. And um, when we explore our, you know, when we uh, evaluate our backup vendors for our own stuff, uh, we make sure that if we're backing up Azure, it's not going just to another Azure site, um, you know, or that the vendor either has a private cloud or a, uh, you know, or is using AWS and vice versa for AWS. 
and uh, private cloud. You should al always be able to uh, get your data and restore. Uh, and you know, you should be able to take it back up and restore at any time. Uh, I've had weird things. You know, we've seen a lot of weird things on Office 365, and um, not that Microsoft support hasn't been extremely helpful and um, certainly, you know, uh, you know, more to it, they're better at admitting the, the exchange than I've ever been. Uh, but stuff still happens. Like, I, you know, I had a client that lost, you know, for whatever reason, something went wrong at Microsoft and they lost an entire SharePoint site. Fortunately, Microsoft was able to resolve it and get it, you know, and bring it back. But stuff still happens. They're, you know, they're not, you know, they're not magicians at Salesforce. They're not magicians at Microsoft. They're very good, <laughs> but they're not magicians. And so you should, you, you are absolutely correct that ultimately you're responsible for your data. And yes, you should have a plan. You know, you should have a plan to uh, be able to restore in the event of a cloud disaster. Thank you. Okay, I want to be mindful of time. Um, as always, we are a very opinionated team, as you can probably tell from this session. So if you do have any questions uh, that weren't answered by the session, feel free to reach out to info at Forelli.com. And as Andrew mentioned, we also have our recorded webinars that we've been doing over the past 13 or so months available on our What's Happening page on Frelly.com. So you can go to Frelly.com and then in the header, click on What's Happening to see any of our upcoming webinars as well as all of the previously recorded webinars too. Thank you everyone so much for joining us and for taking part in this discussion.